we don't, we don't want to touch politics for the moment present. Huh? My name is Alain Perrault, I'm French, I'm working at the French National Center for Scientific Research, working on Chinese linguistics, and uh, mainly on historical uh, Chinese linguistics and typological Chinese linguistics, so uh, the, about the Sinitic languages, so, so Mandarin Chinese as well as other big dialects that we now call them Sinitic languages because we linguists Linguists consider that they are not dialects, but they are languages. The difference between Cantonese and Mandarin is, uh, is about the same as the difference between Portuguese and, uh, and French. I mean, so they are not uh, intel intelligible uh, uh, languages. And, uh, well, uh, so I'm working since... Uh, I entered the CNRS, it was in 1975 or 76, I don't remember exactly, because <laughs> when I made my PhD when I was in China during the Cultural Revolution, the last year of the Cultural Revolution, the period of the Gang of Four, I made my PhD there with a very famous linguist, which is, uh, his name is Zhu Si. and then I was first, when I came, when I entered the CNRS, I, I was working on contemporary Chinese, and after a few years I was fed up working on contemporary Chinese, so I work on ancient Chinese and the evolution of the syntactic structure since archaic Chinese to contemporary Chinese. Well, that's, uh, yeah, I was interested in linguistics because when I was, I was graduate from the University of Bordeaux uh, in southern, south, uh, southwest France, uh, close, to, uh, close to Spain. And uh, and and then when I, while I when I was in university, I have to choose what well, I would like to study literature or history of. And at that time, the Latin was obligatory, and uh, I did not study Latin when I was in secondary school. And there was a new a new licence, was called in French, a new uh, a new uh, discipline on uh, linguistics, which was separated from French studies. And for having for being graduate in linguistics, we did not need any, any Latin, so I, I did not have that handicap. And then I was graduate in linguistics, and then my professor, where well, I was a good student, but not exceptional, but a good student, and my professor, well, we were very few because it was a new field. He told me, if, we, if, we, if you want to be a good linguist, you have to learn some languages uh, that are not Indo-European languages. And it was in 1965 or 66, and at that time in Bordeaux, I have only two choices, study Arabic or study Chinese. And it was a cultural revolution in China, and the Maoist, and then while well, I was a student involved in movement, so I chose Chinese. And then I have to wait many, well, so I, I was graduating in linguistics and in Chinese. Well, my AMA was on Chinese linguistics, and, my, and I wanted to go to China uh, at that time. I was very young, and, and China was closed. And it was open only in 1972. And it was open only for uh, French people because the French government was the only government that recognized De Gaulle when he was president. He recognized China. He was the first Western uh, leader to recognize China and to break to break the relationship with Taiwan. So when it was open, I was the first the first one to go to China, and we were very few. And at that time in China, the foreign student, well, we don't have any American, we don't, but a lot, lot of North Korean student and Albanese, because Albania was, uh, was the closest friend uh, to China during the Cultural Revolution. First, it was a linguistic decision. Well, I wanted to learn a language which is very different from Indo-European languages. And yeah. then, between choosing Arabic or Chinese, well, uh, that was a political decision, but maybe I was wrong because now Arabic is very, <laughs> is very useful in France, <laughs> much more than Chinese. Yeah. Well, for Mouton, well, we are thinking since a couple of years of uh, having a collection of Chinese uh, well, trends in Chinese linguistics, it's going to be called, and it is to translate 
into English the best papers that have been published in Chinese linguistics, in Chinese by the Chinese, because uh, well, in the international scientific community, you know, not everybody learns Chinese and they don't know what's going to, what's happening in China. And then, uh, and then the general linguists are talking. Well, they real, they they don't rely on the last research made on Chinese linguistics. They rely only when the uh, when the papers are are written in English. But the best paper now in Chinese linguistics appear in Chinese journals like in the Academy of Social Sciences, and uh, and the research is going uh, is moving very very fast. And then when the when the when the general linguist working you know, well in general linguistics uh, have to cite Chinese or they cite facts that or or uh, they cite some they cite some theories that are uh, uh, past <laughs> theories that, so that are obsolete. Hmm? So now we were thinking uh, we were thinking that it would be a good idea and uh, and Mouton uh, accepted the idea of having. Uh, Having a series of books translated immediately or one or two years, or the latest research done in Chinese languages by the Chinese. By the Ch and now, of course, in China, there are, there are thousands and thousands of linguists working on Chinese linguistics. I mean, and so, um, so my work is to select what are, what are the best papers to make uh, them readable by, uh, by, uh, by linguists in the international scientific community. Mm -hmm. Well, the academic research leads, of course, have some outcomes that are very useful for people doing applied linguistics and teaching Chinese to foreigners. And now, uh, since uh, well, uh, since uh, well, the last decade, there are plenty, plenty of students studying Chinese now because they want to go to China to do business, and uh, and, uh, and China is. Uh, well, it's the second um, economic power now in the world, and uh, so a lot of people are interested in Chinese. And of course, what we do in Chinese linguistics when we do basic research, it is applied immediately to people who are doing uh, applied linguistics and teaching Chinese to foreigners. So that one thing. The other thing that uh, we are, uh, well, I'm, I'm frequently, I'm frequently uh, Ask to uh, for the business uh, when they, they want to know something about the mentality of ancient Chinese when they have to treat and uh, to sign contracts in China and then uh, so that we are very useful on that way, especially when we are working on ancient China. When you work on uh, ancient, you know, in medieval Chinese, of course, you are, you are working on texts that uh, you have the culture, the background is of the cultural. Uh, the cultural in China, and then of course they are. Uh, for the, the demands are quite high. Yeah. I don't know if I'm going to answer correctly to, <laughs> but now there is a very important field in uh, in uh, still uh, in its infancy in Chinese linguistics is about psycho and uh, neuro linguistics. And so now and. And this is, of course, will be comparative, uh, comparative analysis. And uh, while well, they have a lot of uh, very good studies in neuro linguistics in uh, well, uh, for uh, in Western countries and in Chinese, they are now starting because while well, they need a lot of equipment, they, uh, they have RMI and all these things. That are, and this will be, of course, uh, very important for comparing the two. Uh, is the brain of the Chinese designed the same as the brain of a German or a French, and things like that? And we are located, uh, yeah. we, are, we are located in the brain. The uh, well, uh, specific, specific uh, language, uh, and uh, for working for language impairment too, and all these things. And this is going to be uh, probably very important in the. In the in the next decades and uh, and for comparing and for comparing the two uh, the two words mm -hmm. I mean. Mm -hmm.